welcome everybody. Glad you're here. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to do our opening hymn, and that is number 57. <coughs> hymn number 57, 4,000 Tongues to Sing. We're going to sing the first four verses of hymn number 57. to you this morning we do lift up these specific requests but we just lift up requests in general for the for the health of, of our congregation and for the health of our church <laughs> your church we just pray that that you'll you'll have us to do what you would have us to do we just pray that you'll speak to us through the message of the sunday school we thank you for the message that Bill shared with us this morning we 
And we pray that you'll all, use all of these messages to strengthen us, to nourish our relationship with you, to strengthen our soul and our commitment to be part of your life as you are a part of ours. And we just come to you in Christ's name today and every day. Amen. Amen. Well, today's lesson is <clears throat> entitled God's First Choice. And what he's talking about is, is violence, uh, to explore the relationship between human violence and God's desire for shalom or peace. And um, our scripture today comes from Chronicles. Uh, the background scripture comes from the 17th chapter of Chronicles, and then our focal passages, well, our background scripture is also the entire 22nd chapter of Chronicles, and we're going to be reading some focal passages from the 22nd chapter. But just to, to go back a, a little bit to the 17th chapter, David is, David is king. David is, David is just, you know, David has, gar, has God's heart. He has a heart for God. And God's been with him. God's been good to him. But at a price. <clears throat> because God has put him in a place that he has spilled a lot of blood. Now, God was with him when he did that. You know, we recall various, we recall a lot of different instances in, in David's life that involved battles and military actions. We know the first encounter that we see with David is of course the story of Goliath and his and his defeat of this giant and defeating him. He defeated the army, but he also, if you go back and look, there was a certain there was an instance where the king of the Ammonites passed away, and David sent an emissary to express his sympathy. And they took it as, the Ammonites took it, as though he was sending spies to check on them, to find out what they were doing. So they were very disrespectful to his envoys and to the people he sent to express his sympathies. And so, you know, he, he had a battle with them. So there were lots of battles in David's life. There were lots of military battles. There were lots of there were lots of, of emotional battles as well in David's life. So David decides he, he is he has just built his palace. He's living in his palace, and he's enjoying his great palace. But he says, "Why should I be living?" in a palace, he calls it a palace of cedar. Why should I be living in a great palace when the Lord is still in a tent? The, the Lord still occupies a tent. Well, we all know that the Lord doesn't occupy anything. He occupies everything. But, you know, we we want to build nice houses for the Lord. We want to create places of worship for God. We want to do that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But David said, I'm going to build a temple. I'm going to build a house for God. I need to do this. So he was getting ready to set about doing that. And his Confidant Nathan said, Go ahead, move forward. But then Nathan had a vision. He had a message from God that said, No, no, we're going to wait. David is not going to be the one 
to build my house. It's going to be okay to build my house, but it's not going to be okay for David to do it. It's going to be his son that's going to do that. And we know, of course, that Solomon was the son, and he would be the one to build the temple. So, David, when Nathan shared that message with David, David, of course, he followed the instructions. He set about preparing to build the temple. But he set about preparing it so that Solomon would be able to actually build the temple. So what does all this have to do with violence? What does all this have to do with the, with the message that the, that the lesson is about? And, and you know, it's something that we always wrestle with. Um, I say we always wrestle with. I think most of us wrestle with. You know, we have a military. We, have, we, we protect ourselves with a military. We see that God brings peace sometimes through violence, through the struggle. And let me go ahead and read the first of the focal passages. And that's from, again, the 22nd chapter of uh, Chronicles. And we're going to read verses 6 through 10. 6 through 10 of Chronicles 22. Then he called for his son, this is David, or this is talking about David. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon, and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So, the, the, most of that passage is exactly what the Lord said to Nathan when he when the Lord told Nathan that David wasn't going to build the house, wasn't going to build the temple, that most of that passage right there was almost verbatim what is written in the 17th chapter of Chronicles. It's almost exactly the same thing. The significant thing about it is that he has given peace on all sides. That's the way he describes it, is that there is peace on all sides. Meaning that all around him, there's peace. Meaning that in the land, there is peace. Again, we kind of go back to the, to the, to me, the question, the discussion, the, the contemplation of the value of violence, the value of war, the value of conflict to bring about peace. If David had not won these battles, if, if the Lord had not been with David in these battles, he wouldn't have won them. But if David had not won these battles, if David had not been the victor, then there might not be peace. There might not be peace in the land so that Solomon could focus on this great work that he was about to undertake. Because remember, this, this was a, 
the building of this temple was a consuming endeavor. It was something that, that, that consumed significant materials, consumed significant labor, consumed so much of the time and the effort of the people. So if there hadn't been a fair amount of peace, then this work might not have been able to take place. It might, have, it, might not, it might have taken much longer than it was anticipated. We forget that a lot of these things, number one, construction in those days took so much manpower. People, people had to do it. It was labor. And it took a long time in many cases. We go back to the, we go back to when Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And we know that it occurred quickly because they turned out. They turned out and they worked hard at it. But while they were building the walls of Jerusalem, they had to carry a sword in one hand and be prepared to do battle to, against those who were going to attack them. I know I'm kind of getting off of the subject, but still, the point is that there was always violence. Somebody was always there to take away your stuff, to take away your land, to take away your kingdom. There was always an enemy around the corner, just like it is now. There's an enemy around every corner. And they had to be prepared. They had to have armies. They had to be ready to defend and go out strongly against those enemies. So there had to be violence to bring about peace. There had to be violence to bring about the calm so that in this particular case, so that God's house could be built. So it's a... It's an interesting conflict. It's an interesting, almost a contradiction, if you will. And, you know, it, it, it challenges us, or at least it, I certainly think that it challenges us and, and the, way we, the way we view conflict and wars and military actions. The other part of our focal passages is the, the still in the 22nd, chapter, and it's verses 17 through 19, so I'd like to go ahead and read those, if I may. Any questions, comments to this point? Well, uh, Solomon had everything God had blessed him because he was humble and didn't ask for much from God when God told him basically I'll give you whatever you want and Solomon didn't ask for riches he didn't ask for power or recognition he just wanted to be a good ruler to his people and I think God was so impressed with his humility he said I'm going to give you everything I'm going to add everything to that I'm going to make you a good ruler, and I'm going to make you a military knight. I'm going to make you wealthy. I'm going to give you many wives. Solomon said, it's all vanity. He said, even though he had everything, it, it was vanity. It, it, it didn't please him. He wasn't really happy. I think he determined from studying his daddy David, that all he really needed was God. He didn't need the money. He didn't need the women. He didn't need the armies. All he really needed was to be close to God. All this other stuff was in vain. The Bible often talks about sheep and goats. And they say, we're supposed to be sheep. 
but nobody wants to be a sheep because a sheep doesn't fight, uh, a sheep doesn't look tough. Everybody wants to be a goat. But God said the sheep are completely dependent on the shepherd to protect them, to feed them. They don't fight. They, 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 they don't be aggressive. They trust that shepherd. And he said that he wanted us as Christians not to be goats, to be sheep, to be waiting on God to protect us, to be waiting on God to provide for us. In this situation that you're talking about now, God said David had shed too much blood. David had done everything for himself. He, he was a, a military giant. And he almost, he almost didn't need God. He was so good at fighting and protecting himself. But God said, I want somebody that, that, that needs me, that wants me to be their shepherd, that wants me to be their protector. And so he, he said, like Solomon, that we have to learn to totally depend on God. Not to depend on our bank accounts, not to depend on our college degrees, but to depend on God, to trust God for everything, not just for going to church on Sunday, but for raising our family, for providing the money to pay our bills, for keeping our health up. We need to be sheep, totally dependent on the shepherd. You're exactly right, and and, and uh, to your to your point about about Solomon and, and Solomon's relationship with the Lord and, and and his his insight, you know, Solomon specifically asked for wisdom. You know, we we as you say, he didn't ask for things, he didn't ask for stuff, he asked for wisdom. And you know, wisdom is such a Wisdom is such a valuable thing. You know, we can have all the knowledge in the world, but if we don't know how to apply that knowledge, if we don't know how to make good use of that knowledge, we can know the Bible up one side and down the other. We can know our trade up one side and down the other. We can we can know our we can know what we were taught in school, what our degree is in, up one side and down the other. But if we don't have the wisdom to apply it and make good use of it, then it's not valuable. It's not as valuable as it could be. You make a you also made a great point about Solomon's view of, of so many things. Just vanity. You know, he, he talked about that in Ecclesiastes. He talks about vanity. It's it's meaningless. He used the word meaningless time and time again in his discussion about that. We need to have God. We need to have Jesus first. That's right. That's that's the point. That's the that's that's the thing. Is what you said is exactly right. That we need to be. We need to become sheep. We need to be subservient to Him. We need to humble ourselves before Him, and we need to be willing to follow Him. And that. that and we're, we're going to talk about that just a little bit more and we're going to do these other passages because that kind of addresses part we of We don't need to trust who we know. We need to trust Jesus. That's exactly right. Then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon. He said to them, Is, is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not granted you rest on every side? For he has handed the inhabitants of the land over to me. And the land is subject to the Lord and to his people. Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord God. So that you may bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Of the sacred articles belonging to God into the temple that we will be built for the name of the Lord. So 
He charges them going, with going forward with the work. Hear one thing in, 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 those, in, in that scripture. Hear one thing. He had put the inhabitants of the land under the control of David. That's, that's what David said to Solomon. He has put, God has put the, <coughs> put the inhabitants of this land under me. So, again, we need to, we need to understand the relationship between peace and God and us and God was with David in all these battles David wouldn't have won these battles if it, if it hadn't been for God he wouldn't have killed that giant with that slingshot if he hadn't if God hadn't been with him he, he would never have done it he would not have secured the military victories that he would if God had not been with him and he acknowledged that David was the first to acknowledge that. He, he, didn't take, he didn't take that credit for himself. Now, you know, all of us, you know, if we're not careful, we can easily get a little puffed up and we think we did it, but it's him. It's him that does it. It's him that, that, brings, that brings about the victories that we win, whether they be military victories, whether they be, be the blessings that we secure, all of that is going to come from him. To your point, and the most significant thing about this whole lesson is that we have got to have that personal relationship. The, the only way, you know, the lesson talks about shalom or peace, and, and, you know, everybody wants to see peace. Everybody wants to have, you know, we'd love to see peace in the world. You know, we'd love for there to be peace in Afghanistan and peace in Israel and, and peace, you know, the, the, the peace that we think of. But there is a peace that is beyond our comprehension when we have the relationship with God because it's the peace that we have inside. Regardless of the turmoil that's around us, regardless of the, the negative things that occur, you know, we we get so distracted, we get so upset, we get angry at what's going on around us and the things that are going on in the world and the things that are pulling our attention away from God, distracting us from the relationship with God. We get so upset about those things. We get so upset about them, even if even if it's not because it's distracting us from a relationship with God. But at the end of the day, all we gotta have is Him. All we need and all we have to have is Him, because He will give us that peace. He will give us that calm in our lives. You know, it's. Everything around us may be falling apart, but we have that peace because he's with us. David might have not fallen for Bathsheba. He might not have committed adultery and committed murder if he had not been so confident in himself. He knew that God had enabled him to kill the lie. He knew that God had enabled him to be a powerful soldier. But it was at a point where he had maybe too much confidence. He wasn't thinking about God. He was just thinking about he had sexual desires and he was dating and he was going to fulfill them. He, I think he still loved God at that time, but he wasn't thinking of her God, he was thinking about himself. And I think if, if he had been more understanding that he was under the wings of God, 
he might have had the ability to resist that temptation and wouldn't have lost that child and wouldn't have murdered that soul. That's right. I mean, if, it, if, if we, <clears throat> the only way that we avoid those things, the only way that we are able to withstand them is through them and is through the strength that we derive from them. So, again, as the world unfolds around us, as the turmoil of the world unfolds around us, you know, we're not, we're not battling against the world. Primarily, we are battling for our relationship with Him. That's what we need to focus on. A part of that is going to be to show the world that there's a better alternative, that there's something better. So that's what we need to go forward with the confidence in him, the confidence that he is going to lead us and guide us if we will humble ourselves, if we become that sheep, if we become the sheep under his fold. And we walk with him and we listen to his voice. Comments? Job knew that God was his strength. And even though the world was crumbling around him, he was able to stay under the wings of God because he knew absolutely in his heart that God was a greater strength than all the conflicts he was having. And he was able to stand in the midst of, of, of tremendous turmoil. And David fell <clears throat> under temptation. One reason be because he had kind of got his focus off of God and got his focus on himself. And God still said he was a man after his own heart. But David made a tremendous error because he had taken his focus off of God. He was thinking about his own appetite and he wasn't considering how far he was off track. He took his he took his eyes off of the off of the, the gold a number of times, but yet God still said he was here. He still, he still said he he was gonna make a kingdom that would never let, never die because of him in his name, and so he still has that commitment. And it's the same way for us, you know. We may take our eyes off of him from time to time, but if we ultimately stay focused on him, he'll walk with us. So let's. Uh, Let's hear what our closing prayer has to say. Lord, give us a heart of peace in the midst of a troubled world. Help us to commit ourselves to faithfully do the work that you have charged us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God indicated that he would forgive us for anything if we would come to him in sincerity and ask him to forgive us. And he forgave David, he forgave Peter. He forgave us our mistakes, but we have to realize that we have to admit our mistakes to him and we have to ask him to forgive us. And then we can go on, we can keep going. But again, Solomon said that everything is in vain if it's not centered around God. That's right. Well, why would God cover all the women and everything against on, on Solomon just to test him out? No, God doesn't tempt you. God, God, God may test you, but He does not tempt you. Tempt you, and and that was temptation. And you know, that's. That's just the sin nature, uh, and I'm not dismissing it, but again, the only way to conquer that is through God. It's not, 
It's not God tempting. It's just God that we have to lean on God for our for our strength. Well, I'd see one uh, psalm when we want all them women. I don't know what he can do with all them women. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. I heard that. If God <laughs> gives us a gold mine, he expects us to use it responsibly. He, he's not against us having the gold, but he means for us to use it in a responsible way. To, to remember the people that need help and you know to be thoughtful of our families and stuff. He don't mind us. Abraham was extremely wealthy. And 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 Job was extremely wealthy. God gave him that wealth. But he he still expected them to use it for moral and to use it with wisdom. That's right. That's right. We have our new uh, books for the next uh, lesson series. It seems hard to believe that it'll be here in a month, less than a month now. But uh, the books are over here. There's a box sitting in this chair. So please grab a new Sunday school book, if you will, as we uh, prepare to <coughs> enter that in October. But uh, we'll continue to look at how we can transform in our, in our current series. So I hope everybody has a good week. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Richard.